What's the most important element in your life? Your marriage, your family, your faith, your joy, your sense of purpose and fulfillment. What's the one thing that is the basis for and determines your approach to all the others? It's your attitude. One writer wrote, the longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It's more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures or success, or what other people think or say or do. More than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, a home. And the remarkable thing is we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that other people may act in a certain way. We can't change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on the one string we have, and that is our attitude. I'm convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. And so it is with you. We're in charge of our attitudes. How would Jesus begin when he went up on the hillside and his disciples came and he opened his mouth? The first words that would set the tone and the agenda that would lay the foundation for the rest of his presentation and for this new kingdom that he's come to inaugurate, the long-awaited arrival of the Messiah. And now he's calling on others to repent because the kingdom is near. And face to face, he starts with attitude. The attitudes in the Beatitudes are paradoxical because while the world says blessed are the charming, the attractive, the wealthy, the elected, the secure, the prominent, the famous, the pushy, the powerful, and the proud, Jesus turns the camera completely upside down and talks about qualities and traits that our world would never have listed. And yet it's another proof that he is God in the flesh, because what he proposes to us is so backwards, it's so reversed, it's so inverted, and yet as we pursue it and consider it, we realize it's so true. It's been said that you can't change the direction or force of the wind, but you can determine the set of your sail. And so Jesus starts by having those in his audience consider the mindset, the perspective, the framework that they'll bring to every part of their lives. Attitude determines altitude because it's what's on the inside that pushes us upward and outward and heavenward. Attitude outweighs aptitude. Not that the two can't belong with each other, but to have one or the other. A heart that loves God, that bears the qualities and traits that Jesus depicts. That's number one. It's what you think that determines what you are. And from that comes what you do. So before the Savior gives a to-do list, he gives a to-be list. And they've been called the be attitudes because he's teaching his disciples to be poor in spirit, to be mourners, to be meek, to be hungry for the things of God, to be merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers, willing to be persecuted. We might call this beginning section character because he's talking about the quality of the person that would seek to walk with him. And yet character really is the fruit of the way we think, the way we approach, the point of view we take. It's time that all of us stop blaming others for our attitudes. We are not victims. We choose, we control, we set the sail and the rudder. And as long as the devil can keep us distracted, pointing at those around us or things we can't change, the more he'll have us in his grip. No matter how dire your situation may be, no matter how destitute or sorrowful, no matter what challenges you face, God knows them all. You can still decide for today. First, I'm going to be poor in spirit. With each of these, I'd like to notice several instances in Scripture where this quality is revealed. 
Here the idea is of one who is bankrupt, empty, drained, who doesn't have the spiritual resources, who can't buy God's favor. And Jesus makes it clear at the outset that the Sermon on the Mount is not a to-do checklist that you can accomplish all these things perfectly and earn your way before the Lord. Instead, he begins with an admission. I don't have it together. My life is lacking. And what I've used to fill it has not satisfied me. I'm not happy with the way things are going in my life. I'm aware of my failure to achieve what God would have me do. I'm on spiritual welfare. I'm solely dependent on Him. I'm dissatisfied with the things of the world, and the more I have, the less content I am. I'm dissatisfied with how little of God I have. I want more and more and more. And that sense is what leads to an appreciation for all the character traits that Jesus will describe. If you were to turn in your Bible to Luke 1, you'd find what's called the Magnificat. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, illustrates poverty of spirit when she says in verse 46, my soul magnifies the Lord, my spirits rejoiced in God my Savior. Why? For he's had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. Look at verse 51. He's done mighty deeds with his arm. He scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He's brought down rulers from their thrones. He's exalted those who were humble. He's filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. Why was Mary blessed? The favor that God showed in her life, that she sought, that she received, not because she was worthy of reverence or adoration or worship, because she realized that without God, she was barren. And look what God did in her life. You might think of the tax collector in Luke 18, beating his breast, wouldn't even look up when he prayed, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Or the prodigal son at the end of his rope, he's wasted all of his estate. He's feeding the pigs. He's living far away from home. And there's a sense where he, he comes to himself. This is not what life can be. This is not what God wants me to become. It was better in my father's house. And so the promise Jesus gives, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What's the greatest treasure? What's the most awesome, valuable, infinite thing of worth that God could ever give? What a contrast. God takes the person who's empty of everything and gives him or her everything. Not the arrogant, not the conceited, not the snobs, not the ones that seek to intimidate, push, and rule others. Not the one who says, look how much I have, how much I am, how much I possess and control. Blessed are the bankrupt, those destitute, those with nothing in their spiritual pockets so that God can fill them with himself. Oh, those who mourn, they'll be comforted, Jesus said, well, remember the time when Simon Peter had denied the Savior on three occasions? And he'd been told just earlier that evening, before the rooster crows, this is going to happen. No, it will not. And he swore, called down curses on himself when he told the girl at the fire, I do not know him. And then the rooster crowed. And Peter, oh, he remembered what Jesus had said. And he went out and wept bitterly. Was that a tragic moment in his life? Was that the worst thing that could happen to him? He'd failed. He'd blown it. He'd ruined everything. No. It was the beginning of God's comfort and God's peace and God's reinstatement of Simon Peter. Toward the end of John's gospel, Jesus will ask Simon three times after serving fish for breakfast, Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And it bothered Peter because it was three times noted. And then Peter became the great spokesman with the other apostles on the day of Pentecost and the author of two inspired letters. 
How did it begin? What if he had not broken down and been, as Acts 2 says on Pentecost, pricked in the heart, taken to his knees, sobbing till he could not cry any more tears? It's when we recognize our own poverty of spirit that then we mourn over our condition before God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, if you were to turn there, there's a reference to godly sorrow that leads to repentance and then salvation from which there's no regret. Oh, it's not the regret of the world that I was caught. I'll be more careful next time so I don't have to pay the penalty. But it's according to God, it's a recognition, as the Bible says, that one has grieved the Holy Spirit, Ephesians chapter 4 and 5. Or in Hebrews, that one has trampled underfoot the Son of God and insulted the Spirit of grace. Why do Jesus' disciples mourn? Well, first for my own shortcomings and my own awareness of how far I have fallen. Then it might be uh, distraught over false teaching of others. Because in Philippians 3.18, Paul said, I tell you, even, even weeping, there are those who are enemies of the cross of Christ. Oh, it's mourning over the lost. Romans 9, 1 and 2, that leads to our personal evangelism. My heart's desire, my unceasing anguish and pain is for my kinsmen according to the flesh. I wish I could be under the curse instead of them. Or it's Psalm 56, if you'll turn there, distraught over others' attacks and the things that might, might do to harm us and take us down. Psalm 56. Be gracious to me, O God. Man has trampled upon me. Fighting all day long, he oppresses me. My foes, they are many who fight proudly against me. When I'm afraid, I'll put my trust in you, whose word I praise. What can mere man do to me? Verse 5, they distort my words. Their thoughts are against me for evil. They attack, they lurk, they watch my steps. Have you ever felt that others were out to get you? And you don't know what the gossip is or what the background activity might be that's intended to damage your reputation, your character, your relationships. Now look at verse 8. Put my tears in your bottle. What, what a beautiful phrase that he's got. Here it is. I, I, I'm streaming. I'm shedding. It's coming down. Take all of that. Put it in your bottle. I've had it in my bottle. Lift the load. Turn back a couple of pages to Psalm 32. Psalm 32. Here David writes about unconfessed sin and the misery and the pain and even the physical effects of that. When he says in Psalm 32, 3, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. Day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. God, this was wearing me out. I wouldn't admit it. I wouldn't come clean. I was hiding it from my family, from my friends. We would say perhaps from the church family. And it was just, it was just destroying me. But then I acknowledged my sin. My iniquity I did not hide. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. That's why mourning over sin leads to a comfort, an assurance, a blessed sense of peace that God knows my sorrow. He knows my grief. He knows the struggles that I have faced. But if I'm unwilling to cry, how can God dry my tears? If I'm tough, made of nails, nothing gets me down. I just put on this face and go at it as if nothing is broken within. God can't fix it. It's been said, God can mend a broken heart, but only if you give him all the pieces. The meek. 
This is a word often misunderstood as referring to weak. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Greek term praus has to do with a strong, mighty animal that's been tamed and saddled, disciplined, self-controlled, therefore gentle and humble, considerate and courteous. One who has submitted his or her muscle to the will of another. What example could there be? But Psalm 37 talks about the humble inheriting the land, delighting themselves in abundant prosperity. That's what Jesus promised. You see, it would be through the Israelites' reliance on God that what he promised for them would be theirs in the future. And so what God has in store for us, all the best of this life as we walk and live by faith, what he considers good in his sight, and then heaven to come. What greater example could there be than Jesus himself, who in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and following said, come to me all you who are weary, who are laden down, who are burdened, I will give you rest. I am meek and gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. In Matthew 21, everyone's gathered for the coming of the King, the Son of David. It's the triumphal entry, and he's not on a majestic steed. He's not wearing a crown in all kinds of royal garb. He's seated on a donkey. And they lay down palm branches and garments before him. And it fulfilled the scripture. Your king is coming, meek, riding on a donkey. With God as our sovereign, we're not at the mercy of anything in the world. The earth is ours because we are his. And we may not yet see that fully displayed and it's a promise to come the hungry and the thirsty appetite one of the most basic needs which God has given us no wonder the word of God is said to be more delicious than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb no wonder it's compared to a banquet, a buffet with all that could ever be put on the table, and yet it's more than that. There's no insufficiency in God's dinner table, but rather in my craving for it. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 1 to 3, that like newborn babes crave milk, so we long for the word of God. That's the reason in Matthew 4, when Jesus, after being tempted, after fasting for 40 days and becoming hungry, said, man doesn't live by bread alone. There's something I desire more than physical food. And we're going to come in Matthew 6 to what Jesus said about fasting. It's along these same lines. It's choosing private time with God rather than simply satisfying the physical body. As I consider the B attitudes, every one of them is a characteristic in which I seek to grow. I don't stand before you, not a one of us could, as a person that has reached some super high level in this area or the others. But you and I have learned this, if we feed our hunger for God, it will grow. If we starve our faith, it will die. Sometimes we talk about external things. We talk about attendance, for example, in our evening services and our Bible classes. That is so often the result of what we're talking about here. Because you see, if I am starving for something and you told me that on a Sunday night or Wednesday night, I hadn't eaten for days, there was going to be a meal provided. Do you know where I would be? 
I've mentioned before that on Saturday nights when I was a boy, my dad would always cook hamburgers. And that middle brother of mine would always take three before I even got one. Wasn't that wrong? And I'm telling you, he'd lay out the bread, he'd get the meat, he'd load it up with everything he wanted. I'm standing there waiting. And I'm thinking, who is forcing my brother to eat three hamburgers? Who told my brother, you better eat three or else you'll die? I love my brother. I've tried to imitate him all these years. I want more of a spiritual appetite. I know you do too. I believe if I'm here tonight, if I'm here Wednesday night, I believe God will help feed me those things that will nourish my soul. They shall be satisfied. What satisfies you? What is it that if you had more of it, you'd say, ah, that's it. This is parallel, perhaps, to the first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, poverty compares to a lack of spiritual resources. And now, hungering and thirsting is along similar lines. What is it that if you had it, you would be satisfied? Oh, I think about Psalm 63 and verse 1. About seeking the Lord, my soul thirsts. Or as Ed led us as we began this morning, as the deer... Thirst for the water, Lord, so my soul longs after you. You remember Mary's words that we just read, Luke 1, starting at verse 51. He has filled the hungry with good things. As a dying man longs for food, I want to be right with God. I want to do right by God. And I want to make things right with others. I'm not sure how the various Beatitudes build on each other. For example, if one is poor in spirit, does that then provide the basis for uh, mourning over sin? We can see where it could. When I mourn over sin, could that humble me and bring my strength under God's dominion? That would be meekness. And does that then cause me to realize I need that which God supplies to feed the spirit and the heart and a life, perhaps you can see that one prepares the way for the next and the next one builds on what follows. That's certainly true with being merciful. That is compassionate toward other people in their pain, in their need, in their loneliness and their lostness. Mercy has been distinguished from grace in the idea that grace is forgiveness. Mercy is this genuine conviction that I'm to do something about it. For Jesus, we could go through the Gospels every page. It's two blind men in Matthew 9. It's a Canaanite woman, Matthew 15, 22. It's a possessed son's father, Matthew 17, 15. It's 10 lepers in Luke 17. It's Jesus in Matthew 9, 35 and following. He looks at people and they're harassed and helpless and aimless like sheep without a shepherd. And the Bible says Jesus was filled with compassion. And so he told his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. The workers, that's what's few. Pray that the Lord will raise up those that will go into the field and help them find eternal life. They shall receive mercy. The scriptures often notice that with the measure we use toward others, it will be measured back to us. We're going to see this in Matthew 7, aren't we? Judge not, don't have a harsh, critical, fault-finding spirit, because with the measure you use toward others, it will be used toward you. So the smaller cup you use when you're being negative and insulting and mean on others, the better. Why don't you just throw that cup away? So it is with mercy. Could it be that my mercy toward other people is somehow connected, not in a meritorious way. We don't earn salvation. We understand that. But the Bible says that judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. And mercy triumphs over judgment. And by the way, that's from the book of James. And you'll want to read James side by side with the Sermon on the Mount. 
and eyes will be opened as to the parallels and the explanation James gives that might indicate by inspiration he was aware of this sermon. Oh, that Samaritan. What set him apart from the priest and the Levite when it was a Jewish man that was attacked by robbers and beaten and left to die? He was filled with compassion. When the compassion is in the heart, the hands will follow. The medicine for his wounds, the beast that would carry him, the payment for his expenses. Oh, compassion. Pure in heart. The person chooses compassion rather than judgment and criticism and meanness. Doesn't that remove that filth so it doesn't pollute me, it doesn't defile me, it doesn't ruin me again? If I'm determined to be poor in spirit, doesn't that lead me to pure in heart? If I mourn over my sin and over the problems and burdens of others and what's wrong with the world, if I'm under God's control, that is meek, if I'm merciful, don't all of those qualities, as they fill my heart, leave less and less room for what's nasty and what's broken and what does not belong? To be pure in heart, not perfect, no one is, but sincere, genuine, real, undivided, unmixed, without pretense or hypocrisy. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1. Here's a statement as you begin each day. So then, because we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit. Let's perfect holiness in the fear of God. That's pure in heart. It's not a destination point. I'm there, that's behind me. It's a journey. What is it that pollutes me physically? I'm going to cleanse myself from it with the help of God. What is it that gets in my mind and messes with me, hurts me, discourages me? I'm going to ask God, because of his promises, we sang about standing on the promises, to help me perfect holiness by turning away from those defilements. They shall see God. Is there a greater offer that could be made? You want to see God? We're calling this series Keys to the Kingdom. We could call each of these eight B attitudes a key to what Jesus says will happen in this person's life. Peacemakers, those who heal division and alienation and friction, who build or rebuild bridges instead of erecting walls, those who communicate and counsel and confront, those who bring together people that are estranged and help them meet at the cross and reconnect. Later in this chapter, Jesus will talk about the idea of preparing to worship, and then remembering that your brother has something against you. In the Jewish setting, he's talking about the altar and the sacrifice. Leave it there and do what first? What has to precede coming before God? This sense of making peace. And you and I understand it's not always possible Romans 12, 17 and 18, if possible, it's not always. As much as it depends on you, doesn't all depend on you, be at peace with all men. In Hebrews 12 we read, pursue peace like a target, like an Olympic athlete. Here's the goal. What are you running after? What do you want? What are you striving to get? Pursue peace. Make it 
your aim. They'll be called sons of God. One of my favorite stories of peacemaking is a true account of something Truett Cathy did when founding Chick-fil-A and the business was still beginning. And in the town where he started, there were two competing newspapers and each one used the print to blast the other. And the editors hated one another. And there was a rivalry that was palpable. You could feel it. Everyone in town was aware of it. So here's what Truett Cathy did. He contacted one of those editors and said, I'd like to buy a full page ad in your paper if you'll just come to my office such and such day and time. He told the other editor, I'd like to buy a full page ad in your paper if you'll come. And it was the same day and the same time. Well, the two editors arrived and there they were and they didn't speak to each other. They were at opposite ends of the room. And Kathy said, if you want me to buy the ads, here's what you're to do. I want you to sit at this table and I want you to eat one of my chicken sandwiches together. I'm going to put a full page picture of the two of you eating the chicken sandwich and shaking hands. And here's the caption. We disagree on many things, but there's one thing we both agree on. This is the best chicken sandwich we've ever eaten. I noticed during the college football games, and I don't mean to promote Chick-fil-A, but I'm just telling you what the source, they had a broken down car and all the people who were in trouble were wearing University of Alabama shirts. And these Auburn fans came by. Would they see the Alabama shirts and help them anyway? They did, and vice versa. And then he used these two teams that were rivals and go on and on. Peacemaking is finding something in common, saying there's something bigger, there's something more important, there's something that outweighs so many things that people squabble and fuss about. Persecuted. Here, Jesus turns from what you choose and your actions and your character and what now you choose in response to other people's conduct. And notice three promises. This is the only one of the eight that has the triple deal here. Theirs is the kingdom of God. Then Jesus switches from third person they to second person you. Your reward will be great in heaven. And then third, this is the way they persecuted the prophets. They mistreated them because they were right with God. What a contrast with the desire to be popular, to be well-liked by everyone, to be welcome in every social setting. Blessed are those with a long list of friends. Blessed are those who are connected, who have this network that reaches everybody, that gets along no matter what it takes. Jesus said, no. Blessed are you. When you are insulted, you are harassed, you're aggravated. It's a good sign, 1 Peter 4, 13 to 16. And it's also in 1 Peter 5. If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but glorify God in that name. And finally, Luke 6 is somewhat parallel to this passage. And after Jesus says, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are, now he says, woe to. And his woes and his blessings are swapped in terms of what many might propose. We might say, blessed are you who are rich. Blessed are you who are well fed. Blessed are you who laugh. Blessed are you when all men speak well of you. Jesus says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Not that there's anything wrong with riches that God provides that we use for him as stewards, but if that's all we have, that's the only comfort we have. If we're well fed and because of that we don't feel a starvation for the things of God, we're going to be hungry when the great day comes. Oh, if we laugh because we take things so superficially, so lightly and easily that we're not broken by our sin, one day we will mourn and weep. And if all men speak well of us, it may be that we've not taken the stand. We've not spoken the word. We've not 
held the ground that God would have us to because those who hated Jesus did so in spite of the fact that he bore all of these qualities to the maximum degree. Oh, attitude. You can't choose the force or direction of the wind. But you can move your sail. Kingdom of God. This is where it begins. I'm poor. I'm sorrowful. I'm empty. I'm hungry. I'm thirsting. My strength isn't getting me what I thought it would. I'm not at peace. I need a relationship with God and with myself and with other people. I want to be bold. I want to be courageous for the teachings of the Lord, no matter what the consequences may be. And those listening to Jesus that day and those of us listening to him today make the same decision as to the attitude we'll choose. As always, we offer the Lord's invitation. If you are convicted, as we've talked today, pricked in the heart, and like Acts 2, you're crying, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. If we can support you in any spiritual need you have, won't you come? Let's stand and sing.